Philly Startup Leaders presents Founder Factory 2015. This program was recorded January 13, 2015 at The Hub at Cirrus Center in Philadelphia. This year's Founder Factory is brought to you by these sponsors. Broadpath, the Innovation Center at 3401, Startup PHL, and Morgan Lewis. In video five, a conversation with Apu Gupta, co-founder and CEO of Curalate. I am Zach Seward. I am your afternoon MC. Uh, when I'm not MCing, I am the editor of Technically Philly and a bunch of other technicallys around the East Coast. Uh, we're gonna get going here because we're gonna we're gonna keep. Rick assures me that this has been a pretty tight ship so far in terms of time and stuff. I don't want to really, I don't want to ruin what he's got going on. So I'm gonna sit back down and introduce our next speaker. We're gonna get going on a really fun adventure here. First, I would be remiss if I didn't remind all of you here that Philly Tech Week, the dates of which were just announced uh, recently, is April 17th through 25th. Please do check it out. The new Philly Tech Week 2015 website is now live as of this morning. That was not a coincidence, given that this event is happening today. So, that being said, I'm gonna welcome Apu Gupta up to the stage. He was formerly a storage entrepreneur, and I hear maybe once or twice that he did a pivot into his current venture, which is Curalate. Please welcome Apu Gupta. He's gonna have a few words. Welcome to the stage. Yay! Thanks everybody for, uh, for attending. I guess, are there sessions at this? No, so just, well then, thanks for not leaving. Um, okay, so uh, my name's Apu. Um, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Curalate. I'm gonna talk to you a little bit today about, um, about PR and how Curalate uses uh, traditional PR, PR with you know, traditional publications and things like that as a means to grow awareness, um, traction, uh, customer, our customer base, um, and kind of some of the things that we've done to get press, uh, the way we, some of the lessons that we've learned along the way uh, in terms of um, thinking about, about actually going to market with a, with a PR firm and, and those sorts of things. Um, so my slides won't take very long, um, and, and so I just want to leave a lot of time for you guys to ask questions. Um, so we'll kind of go with that. So just in case any of you have never heard of us, which is probably the majority of you, um, the Curalate is a, so, is a leading social media marketing platform for images. We help um, brands use imagery to make business decisions and to make more personal connections with consumers. We are about two and a half years old now. Uh, we are 75 people. We're based here in Philly with offices in New York and Seattle. And the company was started um, with the premise that consumers increasingly are communicating using pictures rather than words. Increasingly, we're seeing that com consumers are sort of ditching text. Uh, they're sort of trading blogs for, for places like BuzzFeed. And you're, you're seeing this kind of happen throughout the web, uh, most acutely on social, but sort of everywhere you go today, this is kind of what consumers do. Um, and so what we did at Curalate is we built, these, we built a few products that, that essentially help brands drive engagement, traffic, and revenue um, using images. Uh, we, three products that we have, Dashboard, FanRail, and Like to Buy, basically makes images shoppable, helps use images to drive traffic, and basically helps brands understand what kind of images matter to their, to their, uh, to their consumers. And this trend that we're, we're operating on is a fairly new idea for people. So there was a lot of sort of novelty in this concept when we started a couple of years ago, and that was um, a big reason why we were able to do as well as we've, we've been able to do with press. Um, but this also was very novel to brands, and as a result, um, you know, we were very early in this market, and we've been fortunate enough to have uh, done very well here. So we, we now work with over 500 of the world's largest brands. We're particularly strong in retail. Um, folks like Nordstrom, Neiman Marcus, Saks Fifth Avenue, um, Urban Outfitters, is a, we, we work with a, almost every Urban Outfitters brand. Um, and, uh, and, and a big reason that we were able to get in front of a lot of these brands is because of press. And so what we're gonna talk about today here is really how we've, how we've leveraged press um, and sort of the results that we got. 
So in 2014 alone, we had 449 press mentions. Um, and we, we, got, we got one this morning, so we're now at one for the year already. And we, you know, we'll probably do something like this again. Um, you know, not bad for a little company from Philly uh, to, to get this. And our press mentions were in every major national publication, um, as well as a lot of local publications. So folks like Fast Company, New York, New York Times, Adweek, et cetera. Um, and, but getting here, you know, has been, has been a journey. I mean, we started in 2012, and you don't, you don't get into, you know, Wired or the New York Times in your first, you know, six months of, of business. You have, to, you have to sort of get here. Um, and and we, have, we have worked very hard to um, build up relationships with these sorts of publications. The hardest one, of course, has been technically Philly, a very, very difficult publication <laughs> to get into. You guys are, I mean, top notch. Like really, really, no. Uh, uh, so anyway, so so we um, we work we work really hard to build up these relationships with journalists at a lot of different places. Um, but a lot of this is, is all about starting small. We, we started with a ton of kind of trade publications in the social media space, um, built up our reputation there. And as as you get a chorus of those sorts of folks talking about you, journalists sort of further. Uh, up the food chain, start to hear about you, and then start to actually request um, uh, an introduction and, and want to talk, talk about you. The press for us has been really powerful. 20% um, of, our, of our web traffic actually now results from, from press. Uh, th about 30% of all of our leads um, come from, from, as a result of press. Um, and the leads that we get from press convert at twice the rate of all the other channels that we get leads from, including paid channels and, and everything else. Um, this is a, our PR program has paid for itself many times over. Um, it's been you know it's been hugely effective for us. Um, and when we first started with press, you know, and this I'll get, sort of get into sort of the, the types of press articles that we've done, as well as kind of the mistakes that we've made along the way. When we first started kind of with press, we really didn't know what we were doing. And I think we did what a lot of brand, what a lot of, I think a lot of companies sort of do in the beginning, which is sort of think about press as a way to get your announcements out. So kind of if you're a startup, a big one is going to be, uh, you know, I got funded, right? So, well, I want to get, you know, I want to get press to announce my funding. Uh, it's not, not the hardest thing to do. You know, if you get some funding, you can, you can call a PR firm. You know, maybe you get yourself into TechCrunch or whatever it is. Um, actually, a fairly useless publication, um, just so you all know. Um, but, uh, but what you'll find with this is that this is actually like the wrong way to go about building press. And the reason is that. Um, you can't really like turn on and off press. It doesn't. It doesn't work very well. The, the the thing with journalists is like they they know that you're doing that, and they they don't really like being played. So what they'd rather have happen is that you sort of start to build a relationship with them, and that's what we we realized. Now in the very beginning, um, when we announced this funding, we had actually already spent a bunch of it because we went through. A, the pivot, uh, and and so we actually didn't have a lot of money left at this point. So we really couldn't afford a PR firm anymore. So we did do this as a one-off announcement. We spent a little bit of money, got our name out there, and it was really just to test the idea of um, to sort of help build a, some additional traction for the company to see whether this was an idea that was even going to make sense for to, to continue to pursue. Um, after that, though, after we started to recognize that we had real traction, we actually stopped doing announcement-based fund um, announcements uh, or, or press, and we really went into an evergreen um, solution. So, as of the beginning of 2013, uh, we made the decision to retain a PR firm, um, and uh, you know, commit ourselves to press, which at the time was was you know a reasonable amount of money and more than more than what we kind of had initially thought we would want to spend in any way um, but it was a bet for us we we sort of said look we Advertising is really expensive. We only have so much money. Um, people are really expensive. Um, so you, you know, a sales organization is really expensive. So how much how much can we do in terms of calling on people and all of that? So relative to all the other channels that we can um, we can spend on, we thought press would actually be the sort of highest ROI for us at the at the time, and that, that was really what the equation was for us. So we we went through a very long process of finding a PR firm, and we we retained one, um, and it, it, you know the results have been fantastic for us. 
with that PR firm, then we, we basically started going through and saying, well, what, what sorts of articles should we really be focused on? And we're, you know, when we first launched, we were a Pinterest analytics company. So naturally, we said, well, why don't we develop articles that demonstrate our understanding of analytics, um, specifically our understanding of Pinterest analytics. So we started taking data from our system and saying, uh, and, and going to press venues like Adweek and saying, look, we, we understand uh, you know, that, that there's these things that are happening on Pinterest that nobody else understands. Would you like to talk about it? Now, one of the things that you have to understand is you cannot overstate the importance of luck. Pinterest at this time, at the, be the sort of beginning of 2013, um, was sort of the hottest social media platform there was there was there was going at that time. You could not open you know a magazine without reading about Pinterest. You couldn't you know pick up pick up the paper without reading about Pinterest. And Pinterest itself would not do press. That's a real problem if you're a big if you're like a legitimate journalist because now you're trying to do a story on the hottest thing going around and the company that you want to do a story on doesn't want to talk. So what do you do? Well you basically need a proxy. We were that proxy. We, we basically stepped in to fill Pinterest shoes to talk about Pinterest when Pinterest wouldn't talk about Pinterest. And that worked really well. And so what we decided to do was we, we knew that these, these journalists needed to talk about Pinterest. We knew they couldn't just talk about it in just straight conjecture, so we gave them data. And we, it, it didn't necessarily matter if the data was right or wrong. Nobody else could tell you if the data was right or wrong. The data was right. I'm just gonna, for the record, the data was right. Tim Peterson, if you ever call me, the data was right. Um, but the, uh, what, with this article here was actually, we, we, we found that 50% of all links on Pinterest um, were, actually, sorry, it wasn't 50% of all links. 50% of the links we looked at were going to dead pages on retail's website. So now, why does that matter? Because at this time, everybody was saying, wow, Pinterest is sending so much traffic to my retail site. It's such a big deal, it's such a big deal. Well, what happens if 50% of it goes nowhere? That's a big deal. This article ran just after the Super Bowl in 2013, and it actually delivered more traffic to Adweek than their Super Bowl articles. That was the state, that wasn't because of Curalate, that was because of the state of interest in Pinterest at the time, and that's about you know, being topical. But we realized also there's a lot of companies that can do analytics, and so to how, how do we then further differentiate on analytics? Well, out as, as Curalate's differentiators, differentiator is really about images. You know, it's not just about Pinterest, it's, it's about pictures. And so we said, well, why don't we apply our analytics to the images themselves? What if we actually could release some studies about pictures? And so we actually um, analyzed a half million images from Pinterest. We looked at image characteristics, things like the colors in the image, the smoothness of the image, the background te you know, textures, all this other stuff. And we created an infographic about it, and, and it, we released it to the press. And people lost their shit. Like, they basically, the, Wired picked this up. They, this was um, uh, a recipe from Paula Dean or something. And this thing went everywhere. And now, all of a sudden, brands started calling us up saying, so wait, am, am I supposed to make all of my images look like salad? And that's the downside of press, because here's what happens, right? People take these things as prescriptive. So then, you know, we had to like back off of that. But it did, you know, it did what it was needed to do. And to this day, this one and a, and a corollary article that we've done for, um, or a corollary uh, study we did for um, uh, Instagram are amongst our two most popular uh, articles that we've ever that we've ever put out there. Um, people love to know, like, to think that if they just make their images red on Pinterest and blue on Instagram, that life will be solved. Like, literally, that's what people do. In fact, when we first released this, we got a call from one of the social networks um, saying Pepsi was going to advertise with us, but is concerned because you said that images should be red. So anyway, you, you know, this, is the, this is the fun stuff of dealing with press. Um, we sort of took it further with infographics. So again, sort of this playing this on this idea of like, okay, well, we have data. What can we do with data that's fun? How can we you know, supply journalists with content so that they can make, you know, so they have interesting things to talk about? So we've created a number of infographics over time. Um, infographics, I will tell you, are very time consuming. Um, I, I think they, they work, but they've not been as powerful as some of our other of our, some of our other channels. I also think that, to some degree, uh, 
interest in infographics has, has diminished a little bit. So we're, we're not seeing quite as much interest in, in infographics as we once did. After you start to, to sort of build up this base of like being known for your analytics, being able to get a hand, you know, some, some articles in, some right, in the right places and, and people start trusting you, one of the things that you'll start to see emerge is people start calling you to be a subject matter expert. So routinely we get uh, publications like Luxury Daily who just want us to comment on other people's stuff. So Nordstrom ran some you know, campaign for Instagrammers. We weren't affiliated with this whatsoever. We get calls about that saying, what do you think? Right? Um, it's a great way to build up a relationship with a, with, a, um, with a journalist. The challenge with this is you're generally called at the last possible minute. Um, and if you want to keep doing these things, you have to answer. Which is, which is hard because generally they don't want, you know, they don't want the like uh, director of marketing responding. They want the CEO to respond. And you know, when you're a CEO of a startup, you probably have like a million other things going on and you don't have time necessarily to drop everything for a journalist. But you have to if you want to keep these things, if you want to keep the flow of these things going. So it's just one of the challenges that comes with it. You have to like be super committed to it if you're gonna, if you're gonna do it. Um, Hopefully you end up like with Luxury Daily, they'll let you respond via email. So it's just a lot faster and, and you, can, you can do some things. What it also means is you can sometimes get other people on your team to draft something and then you, you can send it out. So that's how you can sort of manage that. But once you can kind of build that flow, you can get to this and then you can, get, you can just start finding yourself in a, lot of, uh, in a lot of publications quickly. The other sort of story that we've done a, a lot of, I mean, much to my dismay, unfortunately, but is, is, the art, is articles about Pivot. So for those of you who don't know, when we first started Life, we were um, called Storably. Storably was Airbnb for parking and storage. It has nothing to do with what we do today. Uh, that's what we were actually funded for, and uh, a lot of people have been like, really fascinated by that story. And so the New York Times, Fast Company, amongst others, have written about that story. Um, and it has nothing to do with what we do today, but people like that story. And again, it's worth telling because it's worth, it's worth sort of building up awareness around the company. Um, and it's, it's a good sort of general interest story. This article actually from the New York Times actually resulted in Ari Emanuel's people calling us. Um, so, you know, it's kind of worth, for those of you who don't know Ari Emanuel, he's, um, if you've ever watched Entourage, he's the agent. He's the equivalent of the agent in Entourage. So, um, it, you know, it, it does have its benefits, but, uh, you know, this story can only be told so many times. Um, and then if you're really lucky, you end up on the cover of uh, Philadelphia Magazine with Robert Moore, and, um, and then, you know, this sort of stuff happens. So th those are the kinds of press that we've done. In terms of sort of the lessons that I would leave you with, as I mentioned in the beginning, you really need to be always on with this stuff. Um, it, it, it's, it's a tremendous time commitment to do it. Uh, and there have been numerous times where I've wanted to tell our PR firm, um, you know, that I just, we need to stop, um, but you can't. And, uh, and a good PR firm will remind you of that. Um, e even if they're on retainer. I mean, I've like literally said, look, why don't we just take a break for a while? We'll keep paying you. And they'll just tell you you can't. Um, and uh, and, and you, you have to stay consistent with this. I, I would heavily advocate you start with smaller publications. Um, I, think try, I think a lot of people try to go for like, let me, get, let me just get into the New York Times like right away. Those guys are getting pitched constantly. They, the, the journalists at really big publications do not have a shortage of stories. It's journalists at bloggers and smaller journalists, you know, smaller publications that are often struggling with needing something to write, needing to get content out in very, very quick, uh, ter with quick turns. If you can help them with that, you can probably get an article in it. And if you can do that enough, enough people start to hear about you that they'll be interested in you. Um, kind of related to the first, you've got to be, you've really got to be available for this. Um, so you, you, if you, if you do want to go down this path, you need to be committed to picking up the phone, answering emails, um, and responding in a, in a very quick way. Generally speaking, when somebody, um, these journalists, when they, when they ask for a comment on something for like what Nordstrom did or something like that, they're, they didn't just ask you, they asked a few other people at the same time. Whoever gets back to them first or has the best sort of response is the person who's going to get that. And so you've got to be quick. Um, the other thing I, I would advocate is about being patient. So um, this, this takes a while. It takes a, uh, you know, the, and uh, we were a little bit fortunate that we were operating in a space that was very interesting broadly. It wasn't that Curolate was interesting, but that the space we were operating was interesting and we happened to hitch our wagon to it. Um, 
but you know, you can go long periods with getting no press, um, and you can also, you know, it took a very long time for us to sort of break through to much bigger publications, and you have to just be willing um, to, to deal with that for a while uh, and sort of evaluate whether it's, uh, you know, it's working for you. Um, and that to, to do that evaluation, I would say the last thing that you really need to be uh, aware of is that a lot of this stuff is measurable. So tying this into your web analytics, tying this into um, your lead gen, um, uh, your lead gen uh, forms and things like that is really important as well. And then the, the final thing I'll just leave you with is in, in terms of, uh, I, I would advocate using a firm for this, like using an external firm. Um, to find one though, you're gonna have to kiss a lot of frogs. We interviewed a ton of firms, um, big firms, little firms, um, in person, et cetera, uh, and over the phone, all, all sorts of geographies. Um, and I would tell you some of the things that you need to evaluate is understanding, if they get you, and that doesn't just mean you as an individual, do they get what your company does? Do they, do, like, do they have experience with what your organization does? And do they get who your customers are? Do they get what industry you sell into and how those people think? It becomes really important because these people are pitching your company. If they don't get you and what you do and who, who your buyers are, they're not gonna do a good job pitching you to, to, to the press. Um, get a really good understanding of who's doing the work at the firm. Uh, a lot of big firms will 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 you know wow you with their credentials and they'll they'll send in a partner and they'll talk to you and whatever and then some other person is going to do the work who you've never met and you you know it's generally going to be somebody straight out of school who has has no experience and is getting experience on your nickel. Um, that's part of why we chose to work with a very very small firm called Traeger Communications. That you know the principals of the firm are the people who do our work. Um, there's only two people. And as part of that, what we did is we made sure we got a 90-day plan from every firm that we, that we sort of made to the final stages. And we said, you need to tell us exactly what you're gonna do over the next 90 days, including what information you're gonna gather from us. Um, and we used that as a way to really get, gather how, well, how structured their thinking was um, in terms of going to market and building press around us. So that's really it. What questions do, can I answer for you folks? Sir. Did you waive writing this kind of content for the popular press versus for the internal content market? So the question was, did we weigh um, writing these articles um, for the popular press versus for our own content marketing needs? So at the stage when we started this, we were uh, four people. We didn't have a content marketing team. So we didn't have the bandwidth to write our own material. So for us, having somebody else write it became content marketing for us, and we could use these articles and you know send them to people, sales prospects and things like that. So we, we just didn't have the bandwidth. Today, we actually have a content team. Um, and one of the things that we do is we produce articles ourselves. Uh, we produce blog posts and various things ourselves. We'll sometimes then send those to journalists and say, do you, before we publish this, do you want to publish this? If they don't, then we'll publish it. Yeah. Any other questions? Maybe in the spirit of Gabriel's book, like, is there a way to cheaply test uh, this as a channel before you committed a year and a half and a lot of money to it? Yeah, I mean, first of all, we only we only committed to to ninety days when we when we first signed with this organization. Um, we had been burned by PR firms in the past, and you know, and so we were we wanted to limit our spend. So I think that's that's one way, and it sort of fo forces them to to deliver some real results. Look, there's no reason why you can't also go and do this yourself. I mean, you don't have to use a PR firm. It's just, it's one, it's one, you know, it's it's super time consuming. Um, and you may, you, the, the benefit is a PR firm has relationships. It's not to say it's some of the smaller publications that you can't reach out um, and start to see whether uh, there's interest in your story. I think you just need to be really focused. You need to be very targeted, though, in who you're going to go, who what publications matter to you. So you, I think you really need to think in terms of you, your buyer and what information sources they consume. And that's who you want to start to go after. Sir? From a measurement perspective, what, have you, like, what analytics are you looking at to then refine how the strategy is changing or evolving going forward? Yeah, so we, we, look, um, we, we look a lot at our, at our web analytics. So we look at what articles actually drive traffic back to us. Uh, we, use a, we use a tool called HubSpot, which once they're on our site, um, we know kind of what, they, what people end up viewing uh, and where they end up 
it, did, did, did people end up converting to leads? Um, did those leads end up converting to deals? So we, we track that all the way back to, you know, not only to like referral sort, uh, meaning we know like for type in traffic versus, orga versus organic traffic and all that, but then we also know by articles how, w which articles and which, which publications have, uh, have, have gone through the funnel for us. In the back. In the morning session, you talked about trying different distribution channels and, and, and figuring out what works by trying them. It sounds a little bit like in the early days, you didn't know that PR would be so important for you. Is that true? In other words, did those articles you do kind of surprise you with how successful they were? So the question was, did, um, in, in the beginning, uh, did we know, did we think that PR was actually going to successful for us um, and uh, and and were we surprised at all by some of the results that we got from this um, I, I think as founders you have a point of view on something that you, you just typically do and from from my experience from two companies prior to this um, PR had always been a very big way that we had driven success in our company so when I, I was a very early employee at a company called WebEx we were very very heavy on um, on PR, and then when I built a company in India, and that we we ended up getting a forty percent share of voice in India for built you know for, we built the second largest pharmacy chain in India. Um, it was heavy heavy PR as well because we were you know trying to get consumers in there and we couldn't afford advertising. My point of view was always a PR work, so for me. It was not. It was. It was never a question of do I think PR will work. The question was, do we think PR will work for our industry? For like, will do will press care about what we're building? And um, we thought there was a lot of novelty there, and we thought that 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 press should care. Um, but I guess every founder thinks that the, that people should care about what they make. So you know, yeah, you know, we were, we were fortunate that. I think in in the interview process of the PR firms, you can start to gauge that. You, you know, you start to see like the PR firms have to make decisions too. They don't, you, you know. I think it's one thing to say, well, yeah, they can just take your money, but like, they have it's an opportunity cost for them too. It's their time at stake too. And if if they have other firms they can choose from that are going to result in better results for them, they're not going to. They don't want to work with you. So I think we were also able to sort of gauge that early and start to get confidence around the idea that we think we can actually get press for for what we're doing. Um, I think we have one more, one more question over there. Yeah, what's your process for coming up with content topics? Um, I, I would say it's evolved. So in the beginning, um, we kind of looked at or here are the assets we have. We have we have some data. We know we can produce some data around these things, and and um, you know we have like a product that's going to come out or whatever, and we can we can talk about those things. Um, now what's happening is you know more and more people have this have data similar to ours so it's you know th that's becoming less unique what we're what what has changed now is now we have customers so now what's what's changing is we're trying to do more and more customer stories because that that is unique to us we have real customers that have used our products to do really unique things how can we illustrate that so in the beginning i think we were talking more in theory and now we're talking more in practice and I, that's kind of the biggest evolution um, with it the, the other thing that's been really interesting, and that, to the question I was asked earlier, one thing that has been very surprising is now, as we're getting bigger and we're getting more press, customers are actually asking us to do press for them. Um, and so that has, been a, that has only happened in the last quarter for us. Uh, but a, as we get more and more press and these customer stories do well, um, what we're finding is that the social media folks at these different organizations use this as a way to go back to people in their organization and look like heroes. So anytime you can make a customer look like a hero, that's, that's always great. So that, that's been like a new thing for us and we're, we're working on that more. Cool, I think that's all the time we have. We hope you enjoyed this program. For more information on Founder Factory and the Philly Startup Leaders, visit phillystartupleaders.org. We produce this program in the studios of the Lubetkin Media Companies in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, on the web at beingthemedia.com. For everyone at Philly Startup Leaders and the Lubetkin Media Companies, this is Steve Lubetkin. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you out there on the net. Take good care.